I'm going to speak um, actually to some of the same themes that, uh, that the general talked about, though perhaps from a slightly different perspective. Uh, some of the same themes that uh, the congressman spoke to, obviously, concerning energy and security. Um, let me start with a proposition, which is that I think today we now have unmistakable evidence that there is a nexus between energy and security, however you define security, uh, economic security, uh, national security, environmental security, if you will. And I just want to start by ticking off a couple of examples of the ways in which that nexus is being exploited and in instances that uh, are familiar to all of us, actually our security is being undermined by those who use our energy vulnerability, about which the congressman spoke, to our great detriment. I'll just tick these off very quickly. Um, the obvious place to start is with OPEC, the oil cartel that dominates the oil production and the availability of oil, and as a result of its monopolistic position, has been able to manipulate prices by manipulating supply. This constitutes, to my way of thinking, economic warfare of an unmistakable character. We saw last year the price of oil before the financial meltdown reaching almost $150 a barrel. After the meltdown, which I personally believe had something to do with that uh, energy manipulation, we of course saw uh, the price come down, but it's coming back up. And my guess is that it will once again, if the world economy recovers, be subjected to the same kind of manipulation by OPEC that we've seen in the past and ultimately have similar kind of dire effects on our economy. Then there's Russia. Russia has demonstrated the ability and the willingness to use energy as a weapon, most obviously against Ukraine to some extent others on its literals, the so-called near abroad states. But not least, at least as collateral damage <clears throat> as a result of those kinds of uh, energy warfare acts, you've seen the dependency of Western Europe and Eastern Europe too on gas supplied by the Russians as a very palpable form of economic leverage on allies of ours and to their great detriment. We've seen Al-Qaeda attacking the oil infrastructure. Notably in Saudi Arabia, we dodged a very big bullet. I'm sure Bud McFarlane will speak to this at lunchtime. When a barrier guard actually prevented an attack that probably would have taken offline one of the most critical oil facilities in Saudi Arabia, and it might have taken a good year to bring it back up with huge impact on the supply of oil. We've seen in the recent conflicts, as those of you in uniform or formerly in uniform know very well, the incredible dependence of our military on energy, much of which has to be brought to it especially at forward operating bases, which of course constitutes not only a logistical problem, but a very significant operational liability. I couldn't resist the uh, opportunity as a return guest to the ROA to point out another kind of economic slash energy warfare namely a topic we've spoken about here before, Bob, uh, the law of the sea treaty as an example of a phenomenon known as lawfare that I believe will be used should the United States become party to it, which the Obama administration, like the Bush administration before it, says it wants us to do, with the following three 
predictable and I believe very insidious effects. First, our oil and gas industry, if it seeks to go offshore, will be subjected to permitting obligations and mechanisms controlled by international bureaucrats who I believe will prove hostile to us. Even if they're not, the law of the sea treaty will require our companies to engage in unprecedented transfers of technology and proprietary information to the international mechanism known as the enterprise, it's Orwellian, isn't it, that will decide which of the two sites that our companies have identified as the ones they would exploit in the deep ocean seabeds, and then give one to the company and give another to another company, one of its competitors, along with the technology and proprietary information that has just been provided by one of our companies. I'm not certain that any of our companies will find that a good idea. As one of my colleagues who's been a lifer in this industry has said, our folks responsible for exploration inside our big oil companies don't share information with the rest of the company, let alone with their competitors. To say nothing of very sensitive proprietary information and technology. So I think it's a mug's game, frankly, that they're going to benefit as they're being told from this Law of the Sea Treaty. But then even if that weren't enough of a problem, the Law of the Sea Treaty will allow international bureaucrats with the most sweeping environmental regulations yet adopted, far more comprehensive, far more intrusive than the Kyoto Protocol. These bureaucrats will be able not only to govern activities in the broad ocean areas, but on the pretext that any waters or air that emanates from a sovereign nation to the broad ocean areas will also be under their jurisdiction. So our oil and gas industry, which is represented uh, admirably by Congressman Green, in places like Houston, inside the United States of America, will find themselves subject to regulation and control and, I believe, lawfare at the hands of unaccountable bureaucrats, jurists, and people who do not have our interests at heart. So I hope we will not get into this treaty. If you want a taste of what this is all about, think about Chevron, which is right now being sued for billions and billions of dollars in connection with uh, some of its activities in Ecuador. Then, of course, there's cap and trade. The congressman uh, sort of finessed that issue. Maybe when he comes back, you'll have a chance to talk to him about it. I find it unimaginable that a congressman representing the energy industry, as he does, will think the imposition of an unbelievably unprecedented, immense tax on anything having carbon in it, which our energy, of course, largely does, is actually a good idea. And yet, in lockstep, like so many others, uh, particularly on the Democratic side of the aisle, I guess he may well wind up voting for this thing. Our hope is to be, if you care about energy security, if you care about our economy, for that matter, that this dies in the Senate. Okay, so those are some of the examples of warfare involving or exploiting our energy limitations and vulnerabilities. I certainly agree with the proposition that both the congressman and the general mentioned that there's no silver bullet, no, no simple solution here. But there are some solutions that, in addition to sort of the all of the above mantra, commend themselves to us. One of which is something called the open fuel standard. This is an idea that is elegant in its simplicity. It builds upon a commitment that has already been made by what used to be called the big three in this country, I don't know what they're called anymore, but they're certainly not very big and they're not missed <laughs> maybe three for much longer. But they took upon themselves an obligation to President Bush several years ago to include in 50% of their fleets by 2012 something known as a flexible fuel vehicle capability. This essentially amounts to a chip and some plastic in the fuel system that enables today's vehicles to use not only gasoline, but ethanol or methanol 
or a combination of the three. What does that do for us? If that were to become the standard practice, not only of the big three and American manufacturers, but all cars sold in America, or at least as some legislation we've encouraged would have it 50% of the fleet by 2012 and 80% of the fleet by 2015, an eminently doable thing. It would mean that we would be diversifying the supply of energy in the part of our economy in which we most use and most wastefully use the imported energy we obtain largely from people who are, frankly, trying to kill us. We bring ethanol and methanol into the mix. We enable a market to be created because there will be lots of people who can use these products. We help to free ourselves from OPEC. I think we may actually break the back of OPEC. One of my colleagues, Ann Corin, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, likes to say we can turn oil into salt with this approach, the open fuel standard. How? By basically establishing that like salt, which previously was a commodity that people absolutely had to have in order to preserve food, and is now, with the advent of electricity and refrigeration and so on, just another commodity. The same could be done with oil if we enable ethanol and methanol to be part of the solution. It is also, by the way, possible that this approach, an open fuel standard adopted by the United States, would almost certainly become the standard internationally for cars sold all over the world, which could mean one other tremendously important benefit. Since ethanol and methanol can be made from not just corn, but all kinds of things, essentially in the case of methanol, as you know, anything that's got carbon in it can be turned into methanol. About a hundred, maybe more, countries around the world, many of whom are desperately poor, could become energy self-sufficient by being able to take their agricultural waste, their wood chips, their algae, their kudzu, you name it, and turn it into fuel that could enable them perhaps even to be net energy exporters instead of desperately trying to contend, you think we have it bad. Imagine what these developing countries have experienced with the price of oil where it was thanks to OPEC last year. For the military, and this is, after all, a conference focused not least on the military's interests here, diversifying our fuel so that we could produce in the field the energy we need to power tanks and other military vehicles could free us from at least some of the infrastructure and logistical problems that afflict us today. Just to give you a sense of this, and I don't have the, the exact figures, maybe Bud will have them, but my recollection is that in the course of a year of operations, not even a year, I think it was the campaign to liberate Iraq, we used more fuel than in the entire course of World War II in Europe. Think about it. That is a strategic problem for our military. And we've got to, I think, come to grips with it. And we can, I believe, by getting to this point where we are incorporating alternative fuels into the, the vehicles that we use, not just our cars, but all of our vehicles. This, by the way, will have a benefit for those of you who are worried about global warming or global cooling, whichever it is, I can't tell, in terms of our carbon footprints. Um, I'm going to conclude by just making one quick point. Oh, by the way, the Obama administration says it favors this open fuel standard. In fact, the Secretary of Energy just the other day announced that he believes every car in America, not just the 50 percent, not just the 80 percent, every car sold in America should have this feature in it. I agree with him. It should. And by the way, if God forbid 
somebody actually does exploit our vulnerabilities. And one of the ways that I've just mentioned takes down a critical part of the infrastructure that enables oil to flow here from overseas. Basically precludes us from operating our refineries because they don't meet somebody's belief of what the law of the sea treaty requires us to have. Or in some other way knocks the supply down dramatically. I will bet you anything that this country will be doing the sorts of things that I've just talked about to ensure that we have these alternatives. It's just that it will be vastly harder to do that under those circumstances than it will be today. So we should get about it. And I'll close with just one other piece of good news. Uh, just the other day, members of our Set America Free Coalition, which has been working on these problems, including the open fuel standard for some time, took a briefing from Ricardo Incorporated, a very innovative high-tech company out of Detroit. And they have an engine that they have developed, which they call the ethanol boosted direct injection engine, which is a next generation engine that takes advantage of the higher octane of ethanol, and for that matter of methanol, and exploits it such that you can, they believe, roughly cut in half the size and the weight of your engine and get at least as much performance out of it, if not more. Think about it. Think about what that would do for our automotive industry, which is interested in this and is, I hope, going to be adopting this technology if we can only find the couple million dollars that it takes to actually prove it out. But think about, it in addition, what it could do for our military. If this kind of technology were able to make vehicles, tanks, non-manned vehicles smaller and at least as effective and certainly vastly more fuel efficient. These are the sorts of things that I believe are in the offing. These are the sorts of things that if we only have the wit and the will as a nation to do them now before it becomes much harder for us to do them will I believe provide considerably greater energy security for the United States and for the freedom-loving people whose inspiring message we heard about a moment ago and of whom I know there are many in this room. So thank you very much. If there's time, I'd be happy to take a question. If there's not, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, well, we have about uh, three to four minutes. If we do have some questions, if people will go to the microphones that are located in the center of the room and ask the question, that would be uh, uh, perfect. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Sure. Doesn't sound like it. Well, the law of the sea treaty um, enjoys the vociferous support of the United States Navy, I'm sorry to say, and I can explain why, maybe Dennis uh, would like to engage in a little colloquy on that, um, principally because it started life as a navigation treaty. Unfortunately, along the trail, it was hijacked by people who wanted to turn it into what they call a constitution of the oceans and a building block for world government. The Navy sort of lost sight of all of that other stuff, which isn't really, it thinks, its problem. So it supports it. Um, you have the oil and gas industry. Notwithstanding what I've just said, it's been told this is going to be great for you. This will give you permits that assure that you can go build your multi-million dollar platforms in the deep ocean area where currently you don't have any actual claim. Never mind all of the problems that we've just been talking about. I sent a letter to most of the CEOs of the oil and gas industry after a piece that I wrote in early May appeared in the Houston Chronicle warning them about the implications of this treaty, the actual implications of this treaty, and inviting them to learn more about it. I haven't heard from a single one of them. So as best I can tell, they're marching lockstep uh, in the direction of a huge liability for the oil and gas industry of the United States. 
Um, you can tell that that's likely to happen because side by side with them, in some cases literally side by side with them, are all of the environmentalists who think the law of the sea treaty is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. And at a conference a while back, I pointed out that I don't think they both can be right. And in fact, I'm pretty sure I know which one is right, especially if you actually trouble to look at the treaty, which is Kyoto on steroids. You have um, other special interests, people like the one-worlders who are very, very keen on seeing this thing turn into, in fact, the template for controlling the space above us, for example. Or in other ways, establishing the precedent of international taxation and governance of the so-called international commons in other ways. So in short, this should be a lead pipe cinch. And basically, the only thing that has stood between the Law of the Sea Treaty being ratified about four or five years ago, when the Bush administration foolishly was induced to say it should be ratified, has been us. A handful, basically, of people who are saying, wait a minute, this is actually not only an affront to our sovereignty, but a threat to our Constitution, which General Baca spoke of so passionately a moment ago because it will institute arrangements whereby people who are neither elected by us to represent us or in any other way accountable to us will have the ability to determine in almost certainly ever more intrusive ways the way we live, the way we do business, what we can produce, what we can't produce, what we can emanate, what we can't emanate, and so on. So our purpose has been to try to educate people. The ROA has been hugely helpful in sponsoring a debate on this, and I think we've joined the issue. And I think as of right now, we'll see. It requires, of course, uh, two-thirds of the Senate plus one to ratify a treaty. Uh, I'm not sure they've got two-thirds plus one, and especially the more people learn about what's involved. I think the less likely it will be that they want it. And I hope especially that's true of the United States Navy. Because while the Navy has been persuaded that not only the navigation stuff is really good for it, but that there are certain arrangements in it that will essentially preclude them from being affected by some of the other, for example, arbitration mandatory dispute resolution mechanisms. I believe they will be caught up in it as well. For example, if you followed the episode, and I'll finish with this, I guess, but uh, if you followed the episode a little while ago of a federal judge telling the Navy that it couldn't do sonar testing, training its personnel as they're about to deploy to hostile waters, where the ability to detect quiet submarines may well be the difference is the Admiral knows, between the survival of carrier battle groups and thousands of American servicemen and their death. This federal judge said, sorry, we think that that interferes with mammals' equilibrium, whales, dolphins. And until the Supreme Court, God love them, reversed that ruling, it was the law of the land. The Navy could not train its personnel. Now here's why this is important. Just yesterday, the United States Senate approved effectively, maybe even formally, I'm not sure, the confirmation of Harold Coe. Harold Coe is a man you may not ever have heard of. He describes himself as a transnationalist. By that he means he believes that the US Constitution and the laws that are promulgated under it, General, is just one of the things we need to factor into judicial decisions that govern our lives. Other things that should be factored into it are whether other people's rules are, or judicial rulings, or constitutions, or proclamations from UN conclaves. Now, if you believe that that's how this country ought to be run, you're going to be very happy with not only the prospect that Sonia Sotomayor, who completely agrees with this, will become a justice of the Supreme Court shortly, but the prospect that Harold Coe, 
who is going in to be the legal advisor at the Department of State, where he will be able to advance all of these agendas, largely outside of public view. Harold Coe will very likely be Barack Obama's next appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court, possibly locking in what he has said in writing he aspires to, which is an absolute majority of the Supreme Court. As of now, believe it or not, it's a four and sometimes five vote margin, depending on which side of the bed Justice Kennedy gets up on any day of the week. But he wants to lock it in with the transnationalist faction being able to assure that going forward, the nationalist faction, as he has called it, never can block the use of these international laws, these international bureaucrats' rulings, these judges in Spain and elsewhere who tell us they will prosecute our citizens, our government officials, and the like. He wants to lock in transnationalism. And if that happens, mark my words, the United States Navy will find, under the law of the Sea Treaty, rulings being handed down by the law of the Sea Tribunal or by some arbitration panel that we cannot control that tell the Navy, you know what that federal judge said out in San Diego? That the Supreme Court of the United States on one of the Justice Kennedy good days said was not going to restrict your training of your men and women to deal with real world threats because we don't want to affect the mammals in the sea? Well, we've decided differently than the Supreme Court of the United States. And from this point forward, the transnationalist faction in the Supreme Court of the United States will affirm and uphold the rulings of the Law of the Sea Tribunal and the United States Navy and the men and women serving in it and the security of this country that they are defending will, I submit, be adversely affected. And I pray we won't let that happen, especially at the behest of the United States Navy. So with that, I salute you all. Thank you for your interest in all of these issues and your help with them. Thank you.